It's the year 2004 and life is good. You've just come home from school and grinded hard against the elite for on Pokemon Fire Red. Only to then listen to my voice at 5 p.m. as you tune in for Star Wars The Clone Wars. Best of all, your parents are relaxed. Interest rates are low, taxes are low, and Howard's had nearly a decade of chalking up wins for his battlers. But what if I told you evil forces lie in the government? What if I told you the Howard government was costing the Australian people $1.3 trillion? So this is a big Howard one. Not only does Australia throw away a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be the Monaco of the Asia-Pacific, but things become so tense that sedition laws came back for the first time since 1960. So we left the Howard story on the 10th of September 2001 with his meeting with the new president, George W. Bush. Now, I'm sure that I don't need to tell you the importance of what came next. And so that this video can be monetized, I won't. What I will tell you is that at the time of his meeting with Bush, Howard was down in the polls to Kim Beasley, but was well on his way to recovering that ground. You see, just a few weeks before, a Norwegian ship, the MV Tampa, was carrying 433 refugees requesting to enter Australian waters. Howard's response was brutal, saying no, and then ordering the ship to be boarded by special forces, before introducing the Border Protection Bill to reiterate sovereignty over Australian waters. The move was extremely popular with Australian people, and the issue of asylum seekers would provide yet another PR opportunity for the Howard government going into the November election. In October, some of Howard's government ministers accused seafaring asylum seekers of throwing children overboard to secure a rescue. A later Senate inquiry found that the ministers knew this to be untrue, but that didn't matter. Howard had found his lane to run in as the tough prime minister who didn't compromise on national security. And so Bush's declaration of a war on terror couldn't have come at a more perfect time. Howard declared his immediate support for toppling the Taliban in Afghanistan. Howard's earlier intervention in East Timor had been a big success, and his election campaign was very much geared around him being the man of the hour. And it was remarkable. Despite being in the lead just a couple of months out from election day, Kim Beasley not only lost to Howard, but Howard gained a bigger majority in 2001. After two failed bites at the cherry, Beasley resigned and was replaced with Simon Crean. But as for Howard, he had a clear mandate for Australia's involvement in the war on terror. And Australia would prove to be a truly active player in the game. In 2002, Australia supported UN Resolution 1441, which censured Saddam Hussein for having weapons of mass destruction, harboring al-Qaeda terrorists, and having extremely grave human rights conditions. Bush himself addressed the UN General Assembly, saying that this was Saddam's last chance to remove his WMDs. The next year, Bush began his invasion of Iraq, and Howard was quick to give his support on the basis that Iraq was violating Resolution 1441 by having weapons of mass destruction. But he also went further, citing human rights abuses and the ineffectiveness of existing sanctions against his regime. However, unlike Afghanistan, war in Iraq didn't have the same popularity. You see, New Zealand didn't commit themselves, and while Simon Crean didn't dispute the notion that they had weapons of mass destruction, Crean argued that Australia should have only intervened if the UN Security Council called for such a move. Not only that, but previous Liberal leaders like John Hewson and Malcolm Fraser were very critical of the move, and above all, half a million Australians took to the streets to protest. Sure enough, as Saddam was deposed in 2003, no weapons of mass destruction were found. Now, in fairness to Howard, while America and Britain hinted at Saddam destroying his WMDs, Howard ordered an investigation into how Australian intelligence got it so wrong. I mean, let's be real, the intelligence was basically this. Mace, show me that purple lightsaber of yours. No, I sense a plot to destroy our freedom. Saddam has control of his courts and the Senate. He is too dangerous to be kept alive. That's good enough for me. Let's send them in. Now, it is worth noting that the shadow foreign minister, Kevin Rudd, also believed that Iraq had WMDs, and he even said, there is no debate or even dispute as to whether Saddam Hussein possesses weapons of mass destruction. The argument before us is what sort of action should be taken. Now, Simon Crean really struggled in opposition as Kim Beasley even challenged him to take back the leadership. Key ministers like Wayne Swan also made it clear they wanted a spill, and so Crean resigned at the end of 2003. Now, Labor was in a four-horse race for the leadership. 
There was Beasley, Kevin Rudd, Julia Gillard, and then Mark Latham. Now, Latham was furious that Crane had been toppled and had been a key ally of Crane's. At the beginning of the race, it was clear that it was only really between Latham and Beasley. Rudd dropped out of the race and supported Beasley, while Gillard dropped out and supported Latham. Latham scraped over the line, 47 votes to 45. And now with Latham as leader of the opposition, he vehemently opposed the Iraq war and went into 2004 promising to have Australian soldiers out by Christmas. Now, it's also worth having a look right here at the Solomon Islands. You see, the Solomons had fallen into something of a civil war in the late 1990s and had reached out to Australia for help. In 2003, Howard dispatched a force of both soldiers and police officers to bring in order. Those troops would remain there until 2017. So, despite losing popularity in the Iraq War, Howard's intervention in the Solomons saw him gain back some of that popularity, with Labor's chopping and changing of leaders not really helping their case. Latham tried to channel some serious Paul Keating energy and came in as a brawler, looking to out-debate Howard rather than outclass him as a statesman. Howard's campaign strategy was all around making Latham out to be inexperienced, even attaching L plates to his name in campaign posters. Now, in retrospect, pretty unsurprisingly, Latham was seen as a bully, and this photograph right here really did some damage. Latham passed Howard between ABC interviews where this shot was captured of him towering over Howard. On top of that, Howard promised tax breaks for small businesses and increased government childcare support. The result was astonishing, with the Libs gaining yet a further swing their way, and Howard secured a fourth term. And it's here that I'm going to talk about that $1.3 trillion heist. So thanks to WA, Australia is so abundant with minerals. And here in Western Australia, we have an abundance of precious iron ore. China has only a quarter of what Australia has. So Australia has obviously always had a rich reserve of natural resources and before had long been exporters of coal. Those Austro-Lovinators have done us a serious favour. However, the early 2000s saw a whole new market that Australia could sell to, the Chinese. You see, China went through serious economic growth in the 80s and 90s, and after joining the WTO in 2001, they exploded. And in order to industrialise so quickly, they needed our natural resources. A surprising fact that you might not know was that Hu Jintao, the president of China before Xi Jinping, chose Australia as his first nation to visit, and earlier, China had signed an agreement in 2002 to buy $25 billion worth of Aussie natural gas. To give you some perspective on just how big that mining boom was, in the year 2000, commodity exports were at $45 billion, and by 2012, they were at $188 billion. That's not just down to inflation either. Agriculture went from $25 billion to only $36 billion in the same time. So this boom was great news for Australia, yet the Howard government squandered it big time in two different ways. Firstly, Howard didn't invest the revenue into any programs that could create future wealth like R&D or education for when the boom ended. This was particularly a missed opportunity as it was starting to become clear that Australia had huge potential in the emerging renewable energy sector. Instead, Howard chose to spend the increased revenue on tax cuts such as halving the capital gains tax, taking 6 percentage points off the corporate tax rate, and reducing income tax rates at the end of his tenure. The cynic could say that this was using the mining boom to buy off votes. But that still doesn't explain where those $1.3 trillion went. With the mining lobby being as powerful as it was, Howard was never going to risk their wrath by introducing a mining tax. He'd only just narrowly survived the introduction of the GST in 1998. However, a mining tax is a pretty essential reform to keep wealth within the country. After all, our natural resources are our natural resources. And allowing foreign companies to come in, dig them up and then sell them off is essentially having wealth leave the nation. A tax would ensure that the Australian people partake in the riches of their natural reserves. Now, the common perception is that BHP Billiton and Rio Tinto, the two big mining companies in Australia, are Australian. But that's not exactly true. BHP is 76% foreign owned, while Rio Tinto is 83% foreign owned. That means that over three quarters of the profits from our mines were going abroad, rather than back into the Australian economy. And while Howard boasted of keeping the budget in surplus, a much more important economic indicator was where private debt was at. Australia had a $1.3 trillion trade deficit with the outside world, which meant $1.3 trillion of our money, well, not my money, I was like seven playing like a Star Wars, was leaving the nation. 
Now, Harold was well aware that his fourth term could be his last, as murmurs even grew of Costello knifing him. And so Howard wanted to finish his takedown of the unions that had begun back in 1997. I will finish what you started. The workers will be well and truly crushed. Work choices will be government policy. So back in 1997, Howard had introduced laws which reduced the power of unions and gave increased power to corporations for negotiating worker conditions. Now with the GST and the war on terror, Howard had put these on the back burner, but in 2005, he wanted to push the power of bargaining one step further towards business owners, and he introduced a set of industrial relations laws called work choices. Essentially, these laws removed unfair dismissal laws for companies with less than 101 employees, and for all companies who had to fire someone for general operational reasons. It reduced the amount of scope that workers had to strike, and increased the maximum lifespan of enterprise agreements from three years to five. It also completely outlawed something called pattern bargaining, which is when a trade union gets a good perk from one employer and then uses it as leverage to demand the same across the whole industry. Look, I'm far from an industrial relations expert, but this was pretty much a move designed to take out most of the playbook for trade unionists. And to no one's surprise, there was much outrage. Another detail you might not know was that it was really tough to get this through the Senate. After 2004, the Libs only had a slim majority in the upper house, and the National Senate leader, Barnaby Joyce, was actually considering rejecting the bill. In the end, Joyce relented and supported work choices, but 2005 would see how it implement another crucial set of laws, sedition laws. John, long time no see, brother. Aye, I know, pal. I meant to call you after Kashiko 4, but... Time got away from me. How can I help you, man? Well, it's it's a bit of an awkward one. Do you know how you made the first Galactic Empire? Go on. Well, I guess the questions I'm asking is how would one do that for Australia? Go easy. Just make a law where if people don't follow, you can say it's treason then. And then just start 360 click stopping nobs. So sure enough, Howard's sedition law saw an amendment to the Crimes Act that brought back the concept of sedition. The last person to be tried for sedition was back in 1960. Effectively, to commit sedition would be an attempt to overthrow the constitution, government, or government body by force, with a punishment of seven years. Now, Howard argued that the precise wording of by force meant free speech was protected because speech wasn't force, but there was also a clause which included the idea of inciting sedition. And it was on this that opposition leader Kim Beasley protested, arguing that it gave the government grounds to prosecute genuine criticism. And so in 2006, Beasley set his eyes on the election the following year. You see, the Liberals were caught in a big scandal. The Australian Wheat Board was formerly a government-owned board responsible for exporting the nation's wheat. Howard privatised it in 1999, however in 2006 it had been uncovered that just before that, the AWB had violated international sanctions to sell to Saddam Hussein who was desperate for food after the Gulf War and purchased at inflated prices. Not only did the board breach international and Australian law, but it opened Australia up for hefty lawsuits from agricultural groups who could claim damages as the AWB didn't follow market conditions. In fact, Beasley was so confident that this was the scandal needed to sink the Howard government that he didn't even use question time to follow up on Costello's 2006 budget, instead focusing on the scandal. This actually attracted criticism for not giving attention to the much more pertinent issue. Then later, in 2006, Rove McManus entered the picture. This one's actually not a joke. You see, Rove McManus's wife had died and Beasley offered his condolences to Carl Rove, who was one of Bush's key advisors. Weirdly enough, it was this that sunk Beasley, and in November, the two young and aspiring Labor leaders, Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard, agreed to challenge Beasley on a joint ticket. They won, with Rudd being the leader and campaigning on his famous Kevin07 campaign. The campaign was simple. Howard was old and stale, while Rudd had a vision to act on climate change to end work choices, and introduce a $4.7 billion broadband network. The election has also been considered a referendum on work choices, and if that were to be true, then Australia certainly voted no, with Labor gaining a huge swing of 23 seats, and after 11 years in the dark, coming back to office. Unfortunately for Howard, he even lost his own seat at Benelong, but after 11 years of Howard, the nation was excited for change. Maybe, just maybe, Rudd could capitalise on this mining boom and transform the nation. 
What could go wrong in three years, right? You might want to ask this guy who was around when sedition laws were first introduced, Edmund Barton. Except that's not actually Edmund Barton, that's Alfred Deakin. You didn't know that, did you? That's why you need to click on this video to learn all about Barton's wild first three years of Australian government.